this uh, teaching and this little sharing I did on Melchizedek, <clears throat> there's actually much more to be shared about this priesthood that we're a part of, not the Levitical priesthood, but uh, the priesthood of Melchizedek, <clears throat> and Jesus, as well as us, is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, the scriptures declare. But um, there's, there is much to be said, but I just want to sort of close out in this session um, and really <clears throat> take just a little bit closer look at this in relationship to us because I have the tendency to not want to just teach truths that are true and have, but have no bearing on our own life. You know, but they're true and well, and so we gain some sort of a status because we know certain things. When I think with God, the whole, the whole thing about God isn't what he knows, it's who he is. <laughs> it's who he is. And who we become by union with him. And the wonder <clears throat> The wonder of that. And we talked about it last time when we were talking about Melchizedek, that we could live <clears throat> after the power of an endless life. The power of that endless life. In other words, the life of Christ and our union with him, like a branch to a vine, has given us the very same life that he has. Now that doesn't mean we're Christ, it means he's Christ and we got him. <laughs> you know, it's a big difference. <clears throat> We're the earthen vessel, he's the treasure. We're the branch, he's the vine. But the, the branch is able to literally have brought forth through it fruit that is of the, the vine life. You could say fruit of the divine life. <laughs> because it is divine and it is also in Spanish divine. But that's, <clears throat> or in French, divine, or whatever, levine. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, there really is a wonder, uh, an, an incredible, wonderful thing in relationship to all that I'm used to bringing forth <clears throat> and what he can bring forth through me. You know, I mean, we can get discouraged if we looked at ourselves too much and saw how we react or what we do or, you know what I mean? Can't, can't we? Isn't it possible to get discouraged? Some of you are looking more like, you know, suicide or, <laughs> 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 but, but definitely discouraged. I mean, I guess that would actually be the least, wouldn't it? <laughs> but but the truth is, we never have to get really discouraged in the sense, and that's where Paul comes up with his thing, cast down but not forsaken, you know, um, is that, yeah, we can get cast down over some things about ourselves, but the wonderful truth is, is that we're not bound to ourself. You know, in the, in the Roman days, what they did was they would, if you murdered somebody, they would take that murdered body and they would strap it onto you and they would tie it onto you and, and uh, you'd have to walk around and live with it. And that dead body would begin to eat you alive until the same corruption that was in it took you over. Yeah, pretty exciting, huh? <clears throat> That'll teach you not to murder. But, that's the, but Paul uses that example in Romans 6 about this body of death. This body of death. And how to put it off by the body of Christ. And by being the body of Christ, not the body of Randy or the body of, you know, whoever. <clears throat> that it be Christ. So when I see stuff that comes out of me, I know that I don't, I mean, I know that I can turn right then and there. Now, now you may not be in that same place, but I know that I can. I know that I can go, n not me turn, not me get control, not that. 
but me step out of me and start trusting in another life. It's a whole different thing. It's a thing of faith. It's a thing that God has to form in your mind. But it's not you going, okay, i got to get a grip here and go with Jesus. It's not that because you, you, you won't do that. Or you'll try to do that and fail. Or sometimes you'll do it and sometimes you won't. <clears throat> so it's, it's not by the will of man or the will of flesh. It's not by might or by power. But really by recognizing the cross, I'm dead. Christ is my life, and I don't have to depend upon me, look to me. I can, you know, <clears throat> I tell people this all the time. I don't always know what's Jesus in me or how to be Jesus in me, but I always can recognize what's me, you know. While I can't always, you know, I'll just say it like this, magically make Jesus come forth, I can tell myself to shut up. <laughs> Sorry, but that's, you know, I can, t I can say that, that's me, you're dead, and you got no business in this conversation, or, you know, you understand, you know, whatever. <clears throat> now, you know, we're waiting for the, you know, we're waiting for the pastor to do that, or somebody else, you know, to, you know, well, I'll, I will continue to run wild until somebody grabs me and rebukes me. Anybody, you know, know that one? <clears throat> And, you know, so you're, you, but, you, but in a way you're going, I'm trusting God to deal with me through my leaders. You know, well, let me give you a little hint. There's a better way. The better way is not men who are with the Lord, but you being with the cross. You know, the first thing Jesus said was, if any man come after me, if any man come after me, <clears throat> let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, Jesus shot down immediately the thought of coming after him with the, with the concept of follow him. Come, deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow If any man come after me, if any man turn and go, okay, I'm going to come after you, he goes, no, nope, coming after me ain't going to get it. <clears throat> Because coming after me involves me, and that's not denying me. Right? That's committing me. But denying, de denying yourself, you can only do at the cross. <clears throat> you don't deny yourself of things. You deny yourself. You're dead. Shut up. Put that down. Stop acting this way. You know what I mean? I mean, you have to learn from your spirit to talk to what's dead and crucified and tell it. You know? It's just, it's like a rebellious wife that would say, I want my own way. I want to do this. I want to. Hey, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it, hold it. Hold it. We play a lot of games, but we don't play that game. You know? <laughs> We're going with Jesus. I'm following Jesus, and you're going to follow me while I follow Jesus? Here we go. You with me? Okay. Okay. Because the soul does want to follow the Lord. It really does. It, it, it's just like a kid that will stretch the boundaries. It's like a wife that will find out what she can get away with, you know. But all you got to do is stick true. You stick true. To the Lord, be true to the Lord. Whether you're a husband or whether you're you're uh, a, a a woman who has the life of Christ in your spirit, and your spirit stands with the Lord and says, "No, soul, whiny thing, you know, thing that throws a fit." You know, it's like I told my wife once. I said, "You know, you're supposed to be a wife fit for me, not a wife that throws a fit for me." <clears throat> well, that would be right, wouldn't it? You know, the Bible says a wife fit for you. But we're not talking just about women here. We're talking about men and women who have melded themselves into oneness with Christ so that they will deny themselves because to not do so isn't just to let our soul run wild or to let our flesh have its way. 
It is to go against our husband Jesus, the one that we're one with. It is to deny the work of the cross. I mean, who wants to, I mean, you know, let's just go out and sin, but don't do something worse than sin. Don't deny the cross. Don't stand against Jesus. Come on, let's be honest. I mean, you know, if you're going to just go out there and, well, let's go do it then. But don't you turn against Jesus. Don't you deny the cross. Don't you deny the one who bought you and paid for you and loves you and gave himself so that you might have him in you. Praise God. Praise God. The victory isn't you getting the victory. The victory is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Praise God. So anyway, this whole thing of the Melchizedek priesthood in um, Hebrews, well, let me just read a few scriptures first and then uh, in Hebrews 7, and then we'll go over to chapter 10. Hebrews 7 and verse 27. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. This is Hebrews 7, 27. For his, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests who have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. <clears throat> and if you know anything about the priesthood, you know that it was first Aaron who was set aside, who was... Uh, and, and in fact, the sacrifice for sins wasn't killed for the high priest, for Aaron. It was killed for the other priests. He was called and anointed and set aside before there was a sacrifice. And that's Jesus, the one who did not sin. And the one who's meant to... You get that picture from Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren. Folks, this isn't just regular brothers and sisters. This is the brethren of the priesthood. This is the brethren of the <clears throat> that, are, that, that are born into the family of the priesthood. We'll get into that in another class where... where Levi, if you were born into the family of Levi, you were automatically a priest. <clears throat> were you a brother? Yes. But you were a priest. And you were in the family. And when, if you were in the family of a priesthood, being in the family meant more than just, hey, brother. It meant we're, we're all priests. We're all called to it. We're all set aside for it. God planned this. This was God's heart. So, so how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, it is like. <clears throat> because immediately we say to, to dwell together in unity, and what we see is everybody getting along and everybody working together and everybody making up for other people's mess-ups and everybody doing, and that's dwelling together in unity. But folks, that's, that would be the manifestation <clears throat> of dwelling together in unity. He tells you what it's like. He says, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. It is like the oil that was poured upon Aaron. Well, that's the high priest. And that was for the consecration of priests. And as it's poured, and notice, it wasn't poured on the other members. Everybody's talking about the anointing. Oh, I want to get the anointing. Well, the priest was anointed, and everybody else, it flowed from him. God didn't anoint them. He anointed him, and those who are in unity with him, it flows down to them by virtue of oneness, by virtue of same DNA, by virtue of the same life. And so it begins to flow down, and it, it is like the anointing that was the oil that was poured upon the head of Aaron that flowed down. It is like that which flows down from him. It is all in connection with him. If, if the high priest is here and it's flowing down, you're standing over there, it's not going to just jump off of him and go splatter on you. It splatters on that which is one with him. 
his body, his brethren, his family of priesthood, a peculiar people. Always a reference to the priest. Flowed down to the beard and then all the way down, all the way down to the feet. That's the unity of the priesthood. It all comes from the high priest so that what is true of the high priest becomes true of us by virtue of union. He is the head. We are the body. We are not the head. We'll never be the head. He's the head. And so it says, who, who maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. So that consecration is ours because of, and here's the difference, is that Aaron had his whole family that were that, and his sons, but Jesus, Jesus' union is closer than family. It is body. It is one person. All members having one life. You agree with that? Amen. All members having one life. <clears throat> now this whole thing about sitting down. You can look over in uh, Hebrews 10. And uh, <clears throat> let's look at verse... Um, Verse tw starting with verse 12. But this man, I want you to notice that phrase. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for, it, for, for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now I want you to clearly notice this man, who is that referring to? When this man made one offering for sins, sat down on the mercy seat, this is referring to the high priest. Only the high priest went in, made the offerings, and found it acceptable, and only Jesus the high priest sat down on the mercy seat. No other high priest ever sat down because the work was not finished until he sat down and said, it's finished, it's, it's done now. Okay? When the priest sat down, no more work. And you've heard it said, but in the, in the tabernacle, there were no chairs, no seats, no place to sit down. That meant that the priests were always working, always working, always working, always working. No place of rest. Well, there, I'm sorry, there was a chair. There was a seat. It's called a mercy seat, but nobody wanted to go in there and sit there because God sat there. You see, it would be, you know, be a little intimidating and try to take that seat away from him. So only Jesus sat down, and that's because the work was done. <clears throat> now there is this whole reality of this Melchizedek priesthood and of, the, of, of what it means in relationship to us with the finished work. <clears throat> but you have to continue to read here, verse 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. All right, made his footstool his enemies wait a minute whose enemies this isn't talking about Jesus of Nazareth this isn't talking about the son of God this isn't talking about the enemies of Jesus of Nazareth this isn't talking about the Jews this isn't talking about Judas this isn't talking about the people that don't like Jesus of Nazareth this isn't talking about the people who are against the son of God and who rage against the son of God this is talking about the enemies of the high priest. Am I right or wrong? I mean, look at, look at the verse. But this man, after he had from henceforth expecting till his enemies. Is, is the context correct? And so, you know, 
my thought was, well, wait a minute, what enemies does the high priest have? You know, I mean, I've, I, have, I have considered the enemies of the Son of God before. <clears throat> I've considered the enemies of Jesus of Nazareth. I think I've been persecuted because of those two. But I've never considered the enemies of the high priest. And yet, it's the high priest that sat down waiting till his enemies be made his footstool. Interesting concept, isn't it? Hallelujah. So, what are these enemies? Well, they are the enemies for which the office of high priest has been established to get rid of those enemies, to remove those enemies. He, is, he has an office that exists strictly to deal with certain things. And he sits down. And this is another, another thought. <clears throat> he sits down, which means a finished work, waiting till his enemies. Now, if the, I thought this was a finished work now. What are you telling me? You know, because he, when you sit down, that means the work is done. And yet, he is expecting and waiting till his enemies be made his footstool. But in reality, when he sat down, all enemies were defeated for the head, but not for the body, not, not in manifestation. What are these enemies? Well, he sits down, and in reality, at the moment he sits down, the enemies begin to fall. Sins and punishment and condemnation and guilt and fear and all of the things that, you know, separation, all of those things, all of those enemies that while he has dealt with them as head, the body has not been propped up and rests with him on the footstool. You know, it's one thing to sit down in a chair. Have you ever been really just worn out and you sat down in a chair and your feet still hurt? But your body feels better, but your feet hurt. But if you put your feet up on a footstool, then they begin to rest. It's when the full body, it's when the body begins to come into this. To come, come into what? And this is the whole thing of Melchizedek's priesthood, to come into the finished work. That's why Melchizedek is not like the other priests and not like the other high priests and not like the other priesthood, which ever works and everything. Only the Melchizedek priesthood sat down. And it was finished as far as the head is concerned, and he's waiting for the body to get propped up in this, under this reality. He's waiting for everything right down to the feet because when the feet are propped up, you better believe there's no more running around, there's no more activity, there's no more trying to do the work, you know. There's no more trying to be right, trying to set yourself right. There is a reality that we are right and I'm looking at it. His name is Jesus and I'm one with him. That's what he's waiting on. Because, I mean, I want you to consider that thought now. I mean, this finished work sit down and this waiting because it's, in a sense, not finished. Because you will, you will run into this a lot in the scriptures. If it's a finished work, then why are we striving? Why are we unsettled? Why are we unsure? Well, the truth is, it is a finished work in Christ. But we must see the Melchizedek priesthood of which we are a part because only the Melchizedek priesthood has fully sat down. Isn't that cool? It's the only one. Men here on the earth, remember what the scripture says, men here on the earth with the priesthood on this earth, they are busy. They're still trying to accomplish something. They're still trying to please God. They're still trying to get rid of sin. They're still trying to overcome guilt and condemnation. Aren't they? They're it's not a finished work for them. They, it is as if the Melchizedek priesthood has not arrived yet. And so they are on the earth 
dealing with the problems of the earth, not realizing that the unity of this thing comes from seeing the head and seeing the unity of it as it flows down to every member and all of a sudden we quit trying to be something by doing and we start being by faith in union. But, but, but you can tell somebody that over and over and over and over and they will still struggle because it is not that you are a, in the Melchizedek priesthood just by virtue of getting saved. Just by virtue of the work being finished. Because if it was, you would need no footstool. It is finished. But you can't, it's not just by virtue of being finished. We have to see of whom we are. We have to see what we are. We have to quit seeing ourselves as separate individuals living on the earth trying to do something. I mean, that, that was the whole thing. I mean, my, my wife asked me about the, the roof, and she said, well, you know, we probably shouldn't have offered money, and what, what do you think we should do for the roof? And I said, we should do what all sons of God do. We should live for God. We should, uh, we should take every opportunity to pour out our life and to, and to manifest Christ in this earth. We should, uh, whatever we do, do heartily as unto the Lord and not as unto men. We should live our lives like we're already dead to this world and alive unto God through Jesus Christ and we're working to bring in the kingdom of God and to manifest that here on the earth. That's what we should do. And she went, well, that's, that's good. I think I'll go tell them that. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, if you're a son of God, you, I mean, by Christ, if you're a son of God, meaning Christ is being formed in you, you have no other mentality. <laughs> Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. You, you, are, you are not trying to find ways of getting out of serving the eternal plan of God in this earth and manifesting it. You're not look, you understand what I'm, Does that even make sense? You're not looking for opportunities to get away. Your life is given to the Father. And when you do it, you do it to the Father, not as unto men. And you do it by the Son. Because you believe the cross. Because you believe that, that the, the resurrection has taken place and Christ liveth in me. And, and if you believe it, it's not, that's not a faith system. That's a faith that causes you to live. He says, I, here, here's the faith of the Son of God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live because you see me moving around and you see a lot of activity happening here, but it's not I Christ liveth in me, and the life I live right here in this flesh, I'm living by the faith of that, of that son who gave himself for me, loved me and gave himself for me so I could be one with him in body and in spirit, his spirit and his nature at work in me. It says of David, David, after he had served the purposes of God in his generation, fell asleep. That's rest. That's rest. My time in this earth is over. I have done what? Oh, I did this ministry and I did that ministry and I no, you can do a million ministries and not serve the purposes of God, which is to, to glorify the Father by Christ. What is the first first commandment? To love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, folks. As a commandment, you try that and, and you're going to get frustrated because you will fall short. But as a life, it is fulfilled by Christ and all of a sudden it's not you trying to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. It is the result of who you are and that's all you want to do. But he didn't just say to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and strength, but to love your neighbor as yourself. And this is the real proof. And that's what 1 John's all about. It's really about talking to people who claim they have resurrection life. I mean, you know, I mean, see, it's, it's just almost, um, it's almost an abomination, honestly. I mean, I'm just being as honest as I can. It's almost an abomination to call something resurrection life when it has nothing 
of what the resurrection has brought, has brought about as far as God is concerned. And the Melchizedek priesthood is someone. Not, a priesthood is an office. Do you not agree? Priesthood is an office. But that priest, that priest, that high priest is a person. It is a ministry after the order of Melchizedek, which ministers through endless life, endless self-giving. What does that point to? Well, let's, let's join the two together. Endless life of the Melchizedek priesthood, who, who not, not after the, the uh, ordinance of uh, the law of uh, carnal commandments, but after the order of an endless life, after the power of an endless life sat down. Okay? Okay, he sat down. Let's look at it from just another angle. Not just the high priest came in there, sat down, and now the body will no longer have to work in its own strength. Oh, the body will be very active while it's at rest. You remember the Song of Solomon as the, as the bride came out of the wilderness. Coming out of the wilderness, how do you get out of the wilderness? You have to enter into rest. That's what the promised land was called, entering into my rest. Entering into my Sabbath. And so she's coming out laying. You know, those beds that they, they would carry like this. And she, she was up there on the thing. She's moving forward, but she's not doing it. It's not her strength. It's not her might. And yet she's active and yet she's not. Well, this is the Sabbath that we enter into. This is the rest of the promised land that we enter into. And that is when the, Melchizedek, when Melche, when, when the high priest of the Melchizedek priest sat down, his life began to flow through the whole body and they would now, every member would be active, would serve God with all their heart, soul, and strength. But it wouldn't really be them. It would be the life of another within them. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. You see? Okay, so let's, look, let's, let's take another angle of that. Turn the camera from a little bit different picture. We see Jesus. This is how we, we view it. We see this guy named Jesus. We don't see high priest. We don't see a lot of things. We just see this guy, Jesus, go, okay, you know, I'm walking around and I'm healing and I'm doing some good stuff, but this really ain't getting it. I mean, there's some deeper problems of sin, so I'm just going to, hey, tack some wood together and I'll just die on it and, you know, boom, and okay, okay, I'm dead, you know, and now, okay, I'm back up, you know. Like, oh, he was down for three days, now he's back up, woo! That was cool. Of course, it was only three days, and, you know, it wasn't that big a deal. I mean, you know, but I mean, you know, I mean, he went in the tomb, then he got up, and so then he goes, he goes up into heaven, and, uh, you know, this is our mindset, and he comes walking through there, and he does all the stuff he's supposed to do, and then he sits down, and we go, yay, Jesus. But it's interesting when you view it from the book of Revelation, you begin to see that the Lamb is the one who sat down. The Lamb of God sat down. Folks, when the Melchizedek priest himself, high priest, sat down, he sat down in a body. It was a resurrection body, or it was the body of his resurrection, us. Okay? When he sat down, that, you know, we were the bottom on which he sat. We are his body. Whose body? It's the lamb that sat on the throne. You check it. Check it out. Honestly, check it. I mean, you know, I challenge you. I, I expect you not to believe everything I tell you. I expect you to, to question what I teach you, and to go to the scriptures and find out, do not listen to me. Do not listen to me. Do not listen to me. 
just hear the words and then you go to the scriptures and you say, Father, show me if this is heresy. Show me if it's wrong. And I'll tell you what I did when I was in Bible school. I heard stuff that I didn't understand because, you see, I didn't have all knowledge when I came to Bible school. Now, I thought I did. You know, some of you remember the little sign I used to have on my desk in, in my office said, uh, said, I wish I was 16 again, then I knew everything. <laughs> you know? Well, when I, when I came to Bible school, I mean, I, I would never have said I, I know everything, but when somebody shared something that I didn't understand or know, I went, well, you know, I never heard that before, so it couldn't be right because I've heard everything. <laughs> I mean, I already have all knowledge, so you... This is weird that you'd be sharing something I don't already know. You see what I'm saying? I mean, does that, you know. But that's what I did. I reacted. I go, well, that can't be right. I mean, I, lit, I did. I did. I say, well, that can't be right. You know, well, I don't know about that. And then later on, the Lord would show me stuff and break me because I were not just. He would show me the truth, and then he would remind me of my attitude and my resistance to his Holy Spirit that is just trying to teach me Christ. And he did that so many times. This is the honest truth, man. In, in three years in Bible school, I must have broke the world record of resistance. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'd go, ah, oh, that ain't right, and all this stuff, you know, and just thought I had it all together. And he would show me, and then I'd come back, and I'd repent, you know, to everybody. And then, then it'd turn around and happen again. And I'd go, oh, okay, you know, and then I'd, he'd show me. And it got so much, it happened so much and so often that it didn't take a full three years. It was about a year into it that I, the, the phrase came to my mind, make your words soft and tender for you may have to eat them one day. <laughs> you know? And I'd already been eating a lot of them. So... You know, I still don't claim to know everything. I don't. What I have seen of the Lord, I have seen the Lord, and I know I've seen the Lord. That doesn't mean that if you don't see what I see, that you haven't seen the Lord in some area. I, I, see, I don't even, it doesn't matter to me that you even get what I'm saying, but I'm asking you to always stay in tune with the Holy Spirit because he will not steer you wrong. He'll always point you to Jesus. And you know what? If I'm really flowing with God, I'll always point you to Jesus. I mean, is that right or wrong? You know? I mean, I would worry if every time somebody got up to speak around here, they went, well, you know, bless God, we got it together, and I especially do, and listen to what I say, and everything I say is the truth. Anybody says anything different, slap them. You know? I mean, I, I, I know I don't know everything. I need Jesus, and I want Jesus. And I'm not even ashamed to say, I desperately need Jesus and want Jesus. So I'm just telling you, don't, don't trust my preaching and teaching. Don't do it. Go to the Lord. Seek the Lord with all your heart. Ask him. Take some of the stuff that might, you might not fully understand and say, Lord, what is this? I mean, I did that, and it took the Lord, in some cases, years for him to show me the truth, you know? But in the meantime, you just walk with the Lord, and you, and you stay with the Lord. So anyway, let me read this little paragraph here. The truth of Melchizedek and Jesus as priest is not that since Jesus won't die, he personally can continue to offer and do what needs to be done without break, because he sat down. You know, he, it's, he's, got a high pre, he's got a priesthood that goes on forever. So here's what we picture. We picture this, we picture this thing of, uh, here's uh, the Levitical priest, here's Aaron, and then, uh, and then he goes for a little while, and then he dies, and then um, Eliezer is raised up, and he goes for a while, and then, you know, he dies, and then, I don't remember the next one offhand real quick. He goes for a while, and then he dies, and then it just keeps going. And, and so, 
Aaron works and he, he does, you know, he offers and he does the work of God and, you know, but then he dies and then another guy comes in and he does the work of God. So then Melchizedek comes along and basically as soon as he gets on the scene, he dies, but he rises again and in his death he fulfills all offerings so that he now, uh, you know, I don't know, sits down. That's a chair, by the way. <laughs> Looks like a ladder to heaven on the back of a tick. <clears throat> <clears throat> One of the things you new students will get to enjoy is the incredible drawing ability of Randy Nussbaum. So, okay. But then, see, we have him continuing. I mean, think about our concepts. We have him continuing on and keeping on going so that he can continue to offer and to do works and do the right stuff. Right? Am I right or wrong? But most of the stuff we got him doing, he sat down, it's over with. So we need to comprehend what this Melchizedek priesthood is about. <clears throat> All right, so let me read this again. The truth of Melchizedek and Jesus as priest is not that since Jesus won't die, he personally can continue to offer and do what needs to be done without break. Woo! No break! You know, I mean, but the greater truth is not based on continuance in linear time. It is spiritual. It is about Christ eternally having completed the offering and moving it out of the day-to-day -day into the completed spiritual realm. He is sitting, he is waiting until his enemies are made his footstool and his body is at full rest. The shadow has been annulled, and with it, the continuance daily mentality. Jesus is seated. Melchizedek is seated. He intercedes on our behalf to, to I'm going to say it like this, and this isn't, this isn't anywhere near correct, you know, theology, but it, it'll give you a picture. He's waiting for us to enter into his body, which is at rest. I know that's, you know, because we are his body. But I'm, I'm just trying, you know, it's like if you can see him sitting there and then him, his feet propped up too, and then we go, you know, and he's praying for, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you, you know. And, of course, we go, oh, Jesus is praying for me, you know. Folks. It's one thing for Jesus to pray for. If it's just Jesus, then Jesus is going to go, I'm, I'll pray for your sickness, and I'll pray for you that you'll get this, and I'll pray for you that you'll have that, and I'll pray. But we're talking about the high priest interceding. The other one back. That's the high priest. And that is one who has... He's not, he's not looking at his body and going, oh, oh no, you know, my fingers got the shakes and, you know, my legs got cancer and I'm, you know, and I, we're all, you know, I mean, if Jesus looked like us, he'd be like this. You know? You see what I mean? We're, we claim we're the body of Christ. My God. This guy is just out there. But I got news for you. It's as if we haven't entered into the body of the priest and come to rest. We're still individuals on a daily continuance basis based on an old priesthood that has not been annulled in our mind, though it has been in our theology. My theology, or oh, Andy, no, I, my theology, I believe with you. I believe it's done. I believe it's settled. Do you act like it? No, I sure don't, but man, I believe it. You know? It's, it's uh, our whole life is wrapped up in the daily continuance, the daily maintenance. Our prayers. 
The high priest's prayers is not trying to maintain and get something together. You know, he's not going, oh, oh, Father, you know. Help Randy to shape up and, and to, you know, get to such a place that he's, here's the example, here's the example. Help Randy to get to a place where he's not under condemnation and guilt. Folks, the high priest would say, he is my member. I am not in condemnation of guilt. Help him to see that he is one with me. That would be the prayer of the high priest who has sat down. I mean, you've got to admit that. You've got to admit that. You cannot run from that. That is the truth. What's the difference? Well, you know, the, what is it? There's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, uh, who, talking about a good man, a man of God, whose eyes are in his head. Well, my head is Christ. My seeing comes from Jesus. I get that from the word of God. I get that from the spirit as he speaks the truth to me. My eyes are not in this head. My eyes are in my head. What is the head of the body? Jesus is the head of this body, and he is the priest of this body, and he has made us of the Melchizedek priesthood because we didn't have life without beginning and life without end until we came into oneness. But the Melchizedek priesthood is without beginning and without end. How does that happen for us then? I mean, even if you, even, even if you have a life that will never end, you still can't be part of the Melchizedek priesthood because the Melchizedek priesthood is without beginning and without end. Uh, it says that. <laughs> you know, we say, well, I, I know I had a beginning, but I, I'm going forever for God. I'm going to live in eternity forever and ever. Big deal. You, you are not of the Melchizedek priesthood until the life of Christ is your life and you're one in it. And the way to be one in it will result in Sitting down. It's almost like you want to say, if you're going to be the body, you have to do two things. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> now, I know that's a little harsh, but the point being, the point being, not sit down, but take your place seated together in heavenly places in him. Ephesians. Take your place in the Melchizedek priesthood, because in that priesthood, he's not, his, see, his life was without beginning and without end, but not so that in linear time he can always be active. His life is without beginning and without end, so that in his body he can always live his life and we can always express Christ instead of our fallen self. Amen? Remember we talked about that last class. The power of endless life is the power of this life that won't end. He, uh, he is continually giving himself. It won't end. See? So that's that reality. So the shadow has been annulled and with, the, with it the continuance daily mentality. Jesus is seated. He intercedes on our behalf till we receive the finished work. He intercedes till we receive it. Now, it's just insane because it's done and the body has sat down, but we have not attached ourselves to that body. We say, no, 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 I have to because I'm part of the body of Christ. On what basis do you base that? Strictly a theological basis. But if you base it on, on a reality basis, the reality of that body is it is at rest and it is filled with the power of endless life. Amen? That's, that's the, I'll just say it like this. And, you know, I mean, I, there's, you can take this wrong, so I've got to be careful. But that's the proof that you're in the body of Christ. I mean, it would be a manifest. It would be a manifestation of the truth if when you get in situations, this endless life comes forth instead of you.
because he's endless. He will not stop. He will not quit. He will not get tired. He will not slow down. He will not be anything less than what he is to the Father. And that we are at rest in that fact. The rest, folks, is that we've ceased from our works, but he hadn't ceased living in us. Right? I mean, he still lives in us. I mean, if, if, it, was, if it was just simply cease, then as soon as we got saved, we could cease from our works by God just hitting us in the head with a hammer and taking us home. I mean, that was just, there, there you go. You know, okay, now we're at rest. Now we've ceased from our works. We won't do them anymore. Okay, well, how about this? How about as soon as we get saved, the reality starts coming that when Jesus died, no matter how long ago, the effect of that is not a linear effect. It is a spiritual effect for all those who gather unto it and believe it and enter into it. And I am dead. And Christ is my life. And I'm at rest in that, that I don't have to be all, you know, nervous and, fr you know, frustrated energy of, what, what do I do? Well, how do I please God? And, oh, I didn't please God when I did that. And, oh, you know, well, you know, it's, again, Jesus is praying. You know, we, we say, oh, thank God the high priest is praying for all the, all the wicked sinners and all the people that are messed up. Folks, he's not praying for the wicked sinners. He's praying for you. I mean, read it. He's interceding for his people. He's interceding for his body. For what? You know, I mean, it's as if, you know, Jesus came down, did this great work, and now the only thing that's going to save everything is prayer. Oh, Lord, help so-and-so. They're messed up. Oh, God, get the demons out of so-and-so. Oh, Lord, heal them. Oh, you know, I mean, the, this is Jesus talking to the Father. And he's just, he's just shooting a billion prayers out because he looks at the earth. Oh, man, fix it. Oh, nations are fighting. Oh, fix that. Oh, God, let there be peace in her heart. Oh, God, this is horrible over here. Ah, everything's a mess. Ah, you know, what did you come to earth for? Well, apparently not much. It's still messed up. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, you know, if, if this view, if what I just described, that view is correct, then Jesus didn't accomplish much. And the only hope is the interceding prayer of the high priest that shapes up a messed up world. I got news for you. He took a, called out. We're the church. Called out of the world. Called out. We've been called out and called in to his body. One with him. And now he's not praying that you'll shape up. He's praying that your eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. That you may know him. <laughs> I mean that's an amazing prayer that Paul said. That that's, that's the prayer. This is, you know, I've heard of your love, I've heard of your faith, i heard you doing all this stuff, but you know what? You need to be awakened to him whose body you are. See, it's not figuring out that we're the body of Christ. It's figuring out him whose body we are. Because you get the right life in there, you'll act the right way. That's right. right? You know, it's like those, you know, those old movies of Frankenstein. You know, and they take all these parts, they stick a brain, you know, and they, oh, we're going to put a brain, we're going to, you know, we're going to bring this man to life. And, you know, they, they, they rob a grave, which is pretty much what most Christians are doing. They're digging in the dead old of everything, and they, they get a brain, and they put it in there, and they don't realize it's a murderous, maniacal weirdo, and they put it in this guy, and so then, you know, they hook him up to the diodes, and electricity comes and hits the thing, and it shoots through it, and you know, all of a sudden Frankenstein starts coming along, and he goes, it's alive, <laughs> it's alive, you know, and then, you know, and then he starts running around ripping everybody's face off. <laughs> that sounds, yeah, that's a version of the resurrection for most of you. I'm a resurrected. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, uh, the whole point is, is that we got a new mind, and it's not some maniacal person like, you it's the mind of Christ we have a new heart it's not 
a, it's not a better heart. It's not your heart improved. It's a new heart. We have a new spirit. It's not a your spirit improved. It's new. And it's all related to union with him. And when, when our eyes are open to this, all of a sudden you begin to go, oh my God, I worked so hard. I did so much. I, I wore myself out. What was wrong with me? And not only that, but I heard this time and time and time and time and time again. I mean, I mean, think about it. Jesus, is Jesus a good prayer warrior? Would he be considered a good prayer warrior? I mean, wouldn't he be the best? But look how long, and you still don't get it. That's a testimony, not of how bad he is, because he's the best, of how hard-headed you are. <laughs> It'd take him this long to keep praying for you. Not only that, but it's kind of neat. There's a totally finished work and the holy, pure Son of God himself praying for you. And the only drawback is you. <laughs> and it seems to be holding up the plan of God. So how stubborn are you? I'm glad we got some new believers in here that are going, boy, these people must really be backslidden. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, can you imagine being fairly new in this, jumping for joy to hear it, and then thinking, well, what is wrong with these people? Why don't we just all accept this and get on with living Christ? Right? Wouldn't that be right? You know? Instead of dragging this old carcass tied to us around and going, oh, God. I just, wish, I just wish you'd heal me of the stuff that's eating me. What's eating you is the wrong body you're joined to. You need to be the body of Christ. You need to start acting like you're the, his vessel. When somebody tells you to do something, don't you show up? We're the temple of the Lord. We're the house of the Lord. Well, who keeps showing up in his house? Open the door. Get out of here. Don't bother me. I'm busy right now. Who was that? I thought this was the house of the Lord. It is. He ain't here right now. I told him it's going to take three weeks for me to get over this, so he won't be back for three more weeks. So don't disturb me until he, until he shows back up. Man, we run him out instead of running ourselves out. You know, instead of getting in there and chasing out the false lambs and the false doves and the false money changers and driving everything out but him. Instead of getting in there and chasing Sanballat and Tobiah out of the temple, we get in there and we just let them live. And hey, you know, on our way to our duties, hey, how's it going, Sanballat? Things going good? Oh, yeah, yeah, the Lord's good. All this vileness, but it's accepted in the temple. And, and just get used to it until Nehemiah gets back. Nehemiah walks in there and goes, what are these guys doing in here? Are you crazy? These guys have assailed us and assaulted us from without forever and ever, and now you're allowing it and just acting like it's no big deal and giving them chambers to live in in the temple? And instead of him going, do something about it. He goes, man, I, I'll do it. I'll get them. And he took all their stuff and he threw it out and then he threw them out. Don't ever come back in here again. This is God's habitation, not yours. I'm telling you, you need to learn to talk to the junk in you. <laughs> and based on what's finished at the cross, it will go. But you've got to believe it, and you've got to make a stand somewhere. You've got to say, you know, even if you're still running rampant in me, I am not in agreement with you. I don't want you, you know. You, folks, you may not have at that moment the power to stop it, shut it down, or get it out, but you've got the power of agreement to say, hey, I'm with Jesus, I'm not with you, and I don't like you, and I don't want you in me, and I may not be able to stop you right now, but I love Jesus more than I love you, pointing to yourself, of course.
Amen? Man, let's go for God. Let's live for the Lord. Let's pour out. Let's, let's not let our lives be in vain. Let's, let's, let's channel them to the, as it said of David, he, he, he served, God, served the purposes of God in his generation. Well, Jesus' life does that in everyone, in every generation. There is one generation counted as the seed, and the seed fills all generations and will manifest through them. But there has to be something that first sees the truth and then embraces the truth and says, I'm with you, Lord. I'm with the truth as it is in Jesus. And I want to follow you. And that, that starts with denying myself. Amen. Well, let's cease. <laughs> Let's cease from our labors. Father, we just thank you tonight for the Holy Spirit who wants to teach us. Father, not me, not anything I've said, but the things that are important to the heart of the Holy Spirit, even things I may not even say. I know you're speaking those to your people here. Father, I want what's in your heart to be communicated, not me. I love you so much, Father. Thank you for allowing me to have the life of the Son in me, allowing me to begin to know these things. Help me to continue to know what it means to be in the priesthood of Melchizedek. Help me. Help us. Till all these enemies that seem to run rampant are made the footstool of the body of Christ. Father, to that end, we pray and with faith in our hearts, our eyes are lifted toward you to for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, Deb, are we going to? Okay, we're going to take a